Hey everybody, it's Tyler Austin. Thank you so much for watching. So today we're going to go over Ed Cohn's training program. Now, if you know anything about powerlifting, you've probably heard the name Ed Cohn, and that's because he is widely regarded as the best powerlifter to ever walk the face of the earth. Despite what he might say because he's super humble, uh, most people who know anything about powerlifting have come to this consensus that he is at least at this point in human history, the best powerlifter to walk the face of the earth. And that's for good reason, because he's a seven-time USPF senior national champion, a six-time IPF world champion. He has over 71 powerlifting world records to his name, and his best competition lifts in a 220-pound class was a 961 squat, a 584-pound bench press, and a staggering 901 deadlift. And again, that was in the 220-pound weight class. He also competed heavily in the 242-pound weight class. His bench and his deadlift numbers hovered around the same, but is I believe his best squat in the 242-pound weight class was 1,016. So his squat went over 1,000 pounds when he started competing in a 242-pound weight class. But arguably, his most competitive weight class was in 220-pound, was in the 220-pound class. Uh, but again, that's arguable. Uh, but regardless, he is definitely one of the best powerlifter, powerlifters, if not the best powerlifter, to walk the face of the earth, and that is really not disputed. All right, with that being said, let's actually take a look at his training program. We'll start with a general overview first. His weekly training frequency was five days per week. So he trained Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. He trained a big four lifts once per week. So other than the bench press, which he trained twice per week. And we'll dive a little bit more into that when we look at the specifics of each day. And Ed Cohn is really known for his heavy usage of assistance exercises. Ed Cohn got a lot of benefit from his assistance work, and as a result, he added a lot of assistance exercises to his program. Um, this is very different to someone like Kirk Kowalski, which had a very similar training split to Ed Cohn. In fact, Ed Cohn helped build Kirk Kowalski's programming. Um, but Kirk did not get a lot of benefit from uh, assistance exercises. So as a result, he really didn't do a lot of assistance work. He primarily stuck with the big competition lifts and their close supplemental variations and did very little assistance work because he just didn't get a lot of benefit from it. Ed Cohn was the exact opposite of that. Um, he got a lot of benefit from his assistance work, so he did a lot of it. And he just stuck with a very basic linear periodization model. He didn't he didn't do any complicated or complex block periodization or certainly any DUP, which really wasn't around during his uh, career anyways. Um, he just stuck with a very basic linear periodization model where he'd start the cycle off doing higher rep sets, typically 10s or 8s, and then gradually work down to five rep sets, then triples, and then finally doubles. So a very basic linear periodization model. Okay, so let's actually dive into what he did specifically on each day. Now, I want to make something very clear here. This is just a very prototypical Ed Cohn program. I'm not saying that he did this literally every single cycle. Um, I'm sure things changed a little bit from cycle to cycle in terms of the rep ranges he was going to use, and he probably substituted some exercises with others. Um, so I'm not saying he did this every single cycle, but this is going to represent a very typical Ed Cohn style of program here, okay? I just want to make that very clear. Also, in terms of sets and reps, these are just going to represent top working sets. So this does not include the warm-up sets that you would obviously do um, for these exercises. So again, sets and reps are just top working sets. So for Monday, Monday would be his squat day. And, uh, and his first exercise would be squats, uh, primarily the low bar back squat. And he would work up to a single top heavy set between two to eight reps, depending on where he was in his cycle. Um, I'm sure he did high bar squats on, cer on certain cycles as well, but primarily he was a low bar squatter. Um, so he'd work up to a single top heavy set of two to eight reps, again, depending on where he was in the cycle, in the squat. After that, he would do single leg presses for two sets of 10 to 12 reps, then single leg curls for two for two sets of 10 to 12 reps, leg extensions for the same rep ranges, 
and set and uh, sets and rep ranges. Seated calf raises, three sets of 10 to 12 reps. And then eventually you do some ab work. Um, again, three sets of 10 to 12 reps. I'm not 100% sure what he did for ab work. I don't know if those ab rollers existed back then. Um, but he did some sort of ab work for three sets of 10 to 12 reps. And that's what his Monday workout looked like. All right, he would then take Tuesday off, and his next training day would be Wednesday, and this would be his primary bench day. And on Wednesday, he would work up to a single top-heavy set of 8 to 2 reps, again, depending where he was in the cycle, in the bench press using his competition grip. Then he would do some paused close grip benches uh, for two sets of, again, 8 to 2 reps, again, depending where he was in the cycle, incline bench press, uh, for the same sets and rep range. And tricep extensions, again, same set and rep range. And then you'd also do some more ab work. Again, I don't know exactly what the ab work entailed, um, but, you didn't, but you would do three sets of 20 reps for that ab work. Again, I'm not 100% sure what exercises, what ab exercises he used, um, but he did some sort of ab work for that set and rep range. Moving on to Thursday, this was his primary uh, overhead press day, and he was quite fond of the behind-the-neck press for overhead pressing, so that's what his primary uh, overhead pressing looked like, and he would work up to a single top-heavy set of two to eight reps, again, depending on where he was in the cycle, in the seated behind-the-neck press. He would then move on and do some front dumbbell laterals for three sets of 10 to 12 reps, and then some seated uh, side laterals for three sets of 10 to 12 reps. And that's what his Thursday workout looked like. All right, moving on to Friday. And Friday was a very busy day for him. And Friday was his deadlift day. Now, although Ed Cohn was a sumo deadlifter in competition, at least before he got hurt and had a transition to conventional, the vast overwhelming majority of his deadlifts in training were actually done conventional. He really only deadlifted sumo in competition, which is very interesting. So on Friday, he would work up to a single top set of two to eight reps in the deadlift. Again, more than likely conventional deadlift. Uh, then after that, he would drop down and do some stiff leg deadlifts for two top sets of eight to 10 reps barbell rows for the same set and rep range, T-bar rows, same sets and reps, chin-ups, pull-downs, um, some bent-over DB laterals, dumbbell laterals, and then finally he would end it with some seated calf raises for a single set of 20 reps. And that's what his Friday workout looked like. Again, it was very interesting that although he was a sumo deadlifter in competition, again, at least before he got injured, had a was forced to transition to conventional, um, Virtually all his deadlifts in training were done conventional, not sumo. Just an interesting fact to know. And then finally, we have Saturday, which was his last training day of the week. And this was his primarily his light bench press day. And on this day, he would work up to a light wide grip bench. And he used these, he didn't really train the wide grip bench like how most people would train it. He primarily used it as a stretch. He really liked the stretch that the wide grips gave him the bottom. And I suppose you could say he used it as some sort of like active recovery type exercise. Um, he just really liked the stretch that the wide grips gave him at the very bottom of the movement. And that's what he primarily used it for. So on Saturday, he would work up to three sets of eight to 10 reps in the light wide grip bench. Then he would do some dumbbell flies for two sets of 10 to 15 reps, a set of 15 in the weighted dips, some tricep extensions for two sets of two to eight reps, some barbell curls for one top set of 20, and then he would finish up with some more ab work for three sets of 20 reps. Again, I don't know the specifics of the ab work. And that's what his Saturday workout looked like. Again, he just used the light wide grips as primarily a stretch or I guess you could say like an active recovery exercise. That's what he primarily used the wide um, grip bench for. Um, he didn't really train it in the um, how normally people would train their wide grip benches. So that's what Ed Cohn's weekly training split looked like. So some conclusions and maybe some things you can learn from this is although his program was very busy in terms of the amount of exercises he was doing, his program was still very simple. He kept it very simple, very logical, 
and it really was not very complex. Albeit busy, it wasn't complex. And he just used a very basic linear periodization model. He wasn't he wasn't constantly swapping exercises and rep ranges um, like you see in modern block or DUP style programs. It was just a very simple linear periodization model where he just work up. Uh, he would start with higher rep sets in the very beginning of the cycle and gradually work himself down to typically doubles at the very end of the cycle. And interestingly enough, he did this with both his, uh, with not only his main barbell lifts, but also his assistance work as well. He actually periodized his assistance work along with his main barbell movements too, which wasn't terribly common back then. Uh, most people just stuck with a certain rep range for the assistance work and stayed with it. Um, throughout the entire course of the program. Ed Cohn actually did periodize the rep ranges for his assistance work, um, along with his main barbell movements. Another thing that we can learn from, or in some cases be cautious of, is use accessory work if it is effective. And if is the big word there. A lot of people uh, make the mistake of implementing a whole bunch of accessory work simply because a individual such as Ed Cohn or another really strong lifter, you know, that person happens to use a lot of assistance work, that they feel like that they need to use a lot of assistance work in their program. Because after all, if Ed Cohn uses it, you know, shouldn't I? And that is absolutely not the case. Remember, there's a lot of other really strong lifters, such as Kirk Kowalski, Mark Chalet, and many, many others that were very strong, brutally strong, very competitive lifters, um, but they didn't use, they used very little, if any, assistance work in their programs. It's a, accessory work is a very, very personal thing. Some people get a lot of benefit from assistance work, such as Ed Cohn. Um, there are some people who get virtually no benefit from assistance work. People like Kirk Kowalski, Mark Chalet, those type of people. And then there's a lot of people in between where there's some assistance work that's very beneficial to them. And there's a lot of assistance work that's just kind of a waste of time. So accessory work, again, is a very personal thing. And some people uh, get a lot of benefit from it. Some people don't get any benefit at all from it. So it's one of those things where you need to evaluate your programming and look at it and, you know, objectively look at it and go, is this accessory work that I'm doing actually providing a benefit to me in terms of building my strength in the main barbell movements. If not, I should probably remove it because I'm just wasting my time doing it. Again, it's something that you can learn from and it's something that a lot of people struggle with where they just do a whole bunch of this work and it's not doing anything for them, but they think they have to do it because somebody like Ed Cohn or whatever, some other big lifter they respect does a lot of assistance work and that's just simply not the case. Uh, Ed Cohn's program was very similar to like a modern day power building program um, that you you know hear thrown around a lot, uh, which is basically just a bastard child between like a very traditional uh, powerlifting program and a bodybuilding program. So you you know you have you do the work, the main big heavy barbell movements. Um, that's very traditional to like powerlifting. And then along with a lot of the supplemental and assistance work, that's very traditional, like the, you know, very traditional power, um, bodybuilding programming. And, you know, it's kind of a bastard child between those two, which modern day terminology would be considered quote unquote power building. Another thing that we can learn from Ed Cohn, along with other lifters, such as Kirk Kowalski, um, which, by the way, I have done a program. I did analyze Kirk Kowalski's program um, in another video I did several months ago. That will be linked um, in the end screen. So if that's something that's interested, that is of interest to you, be sure to check that out. Um, but another thing that we can learn from Ed Cohn and other lifters, um, such as Kirk, is being realistic with your training goals. Uh, it's a very fine line between making goals that are big enough to be motivating, yet at the same time conservative and realistic enough to um, actually be met within the cycle. Um, and Ed Cohn, along with many other um, lifters of his day, were very, very good at building a 12- or 16-week periodized cycle and hitting every single lift in that cycle without missing a single lift. Um, Ed Cohn, Kirk Kowalski, these guys were very good at that, particularly at the very end of their career, 
at at doing that. It's because they were very conservative and very realistic with their goals, um, and they knew exactly what they could expect out of themselves, and they knew what they were capable of, and and they and they kept things realistic. So they didn't try to push themselves to such an extent at each cycle that they knew that it just wasn't going to be possible for them to hit, you know, certain numbers on certain lifts, et cetera, et cetera. And I find myself as a coach, um, that's one of my big jobs, particularly with clients that are very aggressive and they want to hit, you know, big PRs are very aggressive with their training. You know, one of my jobs as a coach is to kind of pull on their chain and keep them, and, and keep them realistic. Um, that's one of my jobs as a coach I found with, again, particularly with very aggressive clients who, you know, you know they, they, they want to be very aggressive with their training and shoot for really big goals. And a lot of times, you know, my job is to, you know, keep them realistic. And that's one of the uh, benefits of having a good coach on your side. So that is Ed Cohn's training program. I hope you found this video helpful, informative, or at least entertaining or interesting. I would appreciate it if you like, subscribe, follow, depending on where you're watching this. If you would be interested in coaching, um, I offer online coaching and I use very old school strength and conditioning strategies like this to help get normal everyday people brutally strong. And that is what I do. So if that's something that would interest you, um, check out the description below. Be sure to send me an email and I'd be more than happy to help you. Again, please like, follow, subscribe, depending on where you're watching this. I'm Tyler Austin. Thanks so much for watching.